Welcome to Road to 250. Today we'll talk about neurodegenerative disorders, and I have a couple of questions at the end. So let's get right into it. So the basic principles of dementia and degenerative disorders is it's um, characterized by a loss of neurons within the gray matter, and often there's a that's due to accumulation of protein, which often damages these neurons. So if you have a degeneration of the cortex, it leads to dementia. And degeneration of the brainstem and basal ganglia leads to movement disorders. So we'll talk about all of those um, in the coming slides. But what I really wanted to highlight was, in this case, why I say uh, degeneration of the cortex versus degeneration of the basal ganglia. So just taking a simple view, again, of the brainstem, you have your gray matter, then you have your white matter. Um, and then you have your lateral ventricles. And then surrounding the lateral ventricles, again, it's more gray matter. So if you take out this gray matter out here, it'll lead to your dementia um, symptoms. And if you remove the gray matter or the basal ganglia that's around here, um, around the ventricles, it'll lead to your movement disorders and um, essentially movement problems because you're removing the basal ganglia. So this is a simplified view. Um, again, came from that for those who are wanting a better explanation. So Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is a degenerative disease of the cortex and the most common cause of dementia. So clinical features, can you guys name me some clinical features of Alzheimer's disease? Uh, you have memory formation problems for new memories. Right. So you get a slow onset of memory loss. Um, it starts with your short-term memory, and then it will progress to your long-term memory. Um, and that also will lead to progressive disorientation. You can have loss of learned motor skills and language. That's called a cognitive dysfunction. You can have changes in behavior and personality. Uh, these patients often become mute and bedridden. And then there's a focal neurologic defects that are not seen early in the disease. So you do not see like a tremor or a chorea. Um, so that we'll see later in the disease. So most of these cases are sporadic and often seen in the elderly. Um, there is an increased risk with age. So it double, the risk doubles every five years after the age of 60. Uh, which allele of apoproteins does the risk increase in, and which one does it decrease in? So you guys know. B40, ApoE. Yeah, so um, E4 allele of apoprotein, apolipoprotein E, is associated with an increased risk, and E2 is associated with a decreased risk. Um, the way you can think about this is 4 is higher, so you have an increase in the risk, and then two is lower, so you have a decrease in the risk. Um, and the early form, there's two types. There's a familial case, and there's also Down syndrome. Um, the familial case is often associated with, do you know which gene mutation? It's a mutation in the presilin 1 and presilin 2 uh, gene. And then Down syndrome often commonly occurs by the age of 40 years of age. So that's why you see the early form. Um, this is like a breakdown that I've created just to make it simple and easy, but you have sporadic form and early form. Um, age is a common risk factor, as I said, and then E4 increases, E2 decreases the risk, and then the early form you have your familial and Down syndrome. So what kind of morphologic features are you going to see? Um, you get diffuse cerebral atrophy. So um, what do I mean by this? So there's a picture. There it is. So here you can see um, this is your gyrides right here. Um, and they're kind of getting narrowed. So these get narrowed and your sulci, which is the space between them, kind of increase. So you first have a complete diffuse atrophy of the brain, and then you can also see narrowing of the gyri and widening of the sulci, which leads to hydrocephalus ex vacuo. Um, 
and that's again loss of uh, due to the loss of parenchyma around the brain. You can see neuritic plaques. This is an example of a neuritic plaque right here in the center. Um, and they have a beta amyloid inside. Now, why is a beta amyloid such a big thing? So we know that in Alzheimer's disease, you have, so taking this, you have um, amyloid precursor proteins that are attached to a cell. And typically the APP or the amyloid precursor proteins are broken down um, in our body. Just write it. And if they get broken down into the alpha form by alpha cyanuclein, um, it gets turned over. Sorry, the alpha is not really big. So these get turned over normally. However, if the um, amyloid precursor protein is broken into the beta product, the beta product essentially cannot be turned over. And this is what leads to the A beta amyloid that build up in our bodies. And that's why you, it's a common feature you see in Alzheimer's disease. So if the precursor is not broken down properly, it can form the A beta um, product, and that's seen extracellularly out here. And then you also see these neurofibrillary tangles. Uh, so what are these tangles? Essentially, are what they help the microtubulin. Um, Aggregates. So they're aggregates of fibers that are composed of hyperphosphorylized tau proteins. So you have a normal and a normal tau protein here, but this tau protein is phosphorylized enormous amounts of time. So that's why um, it doesn't aid in the microtubule formation and it just forms these little streaks. And that's why you see these tangles, is what they like to say, neurofibrillary tangles. Um, and one other thing about this neuritic plaque that I forgot to mention is that they deposit around the blood vessels and the brain. Um, and then with uh, amyloid angiopathy, it weakens the blood vessels and that can often cause hemorrhage. So that's why these guys are big, because they can often lead to he hemorrhage in our brain. And so this is just from first aid. Um, so it's the most common cause of dementia in the elderly. Down syndrome patients have an increased risk uh, because the amyloid uh, precursor protein is located on chromosome 21. So obviously, if you have Down syndrome, you have an extra copy of chromosome 21. And again, like I said, the APOE2 is decreased in the risk, and then E4 is increased in the risk. And then the familial cases obviously are very small but they have an earlier onset. Um, so in the pictures that you see up here, you get widespread cortical atrophy, especially in the hippocampus. It's located right here. Um, and you can see that there's an atrophy of that. And then you get these senile plaques in the gray matter, with these arrows, and they're basically extracellular beta amyloid core. Um, and then these can cause that amyloid angiopathy and intracranial hemorrhage. Again, because you have the build of a, uh, the beta amyloid that's broken down by amyloid or broken a byproduct of the amyloid precursor protein. All right. Any questions about this one? Okay, so. Oh, and the diagnosis is made clinically um, after excluding other causes, and you confirm the diagnosis of Alzheimer's uh, at autopsy when you do a histology, but obviously you can't really do that when the patient's alive. So the next one we'll talk about is vascular dementia. Uh, it's a multifocal infarction and injury due to either hypertension, atherosclerosis, or vasculitis. Um, the infarction occurs due to decreased blood flow in the brain or decreased blood flow to the brain, and it's the second most common cause of dementia. So from first aid, it's the result of multiple artery infarct or, or chronic ischemia 
you can see a stepwise decline in the cognitive ability with the late onset memory impairment. And like I said, it's the second most common cause of dementia in the elderly. So PIC disease, um, this is a degenerative disease of the which lobe? Do you guys know which lobe the effects? Frontotemporal? Correct, frontal and temporal lobe. Um, and then it spares the parietal and occipital lobe. So this is characterized by round aggregates of tau protein or pig bodies in the neuron uh, of the cortex. So as we talked about, tau proteins are microtubule associated proteins and they help microtubules uh, arrange properly and they're just an aggregate of that protein that you see in pig disease. And they're called pig bodies. So behavioral and language symptoms arise early and eventually progress to dementia. Which lobe uh, is affected of the behavioral side and which lobe affects the language side? Parietal is the uh, uh, language and temporal is, uh, I don't know, actually, I'm messing with <laughs> So remember here, your parietal and occipital lobes are spared, so they're not affected. So um, your frontal is your behavioral, which affects the behavioral side, and then your temporal is what affects the language. So just know that. Um, it's also known as frontal temporal dementia so, because it affects the frontal and temporal cortex, um, but it can also go with tick disease as another name. So these patients have an early change in personality and behavior um, or aphasia. And they may have associated motor uh, movement disorders such as Parkinsonism, but not really sure. Um, so in here you see the degeneration of the frontal temporal lobes. And you also get inclusions of hyperphosphorylated tau's around the pig bodies. So that's the end of this picture. All right. Parkinson's disease, I know we've covered this in great detail in another lecture, but we're just going to go over it very briefly. Um, so it's a degenerative loss of the dopaner, dopaner, dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra of the basal ganglia. Um, it's a common disorder. It's related to aging, uh, so it's 2% of the older adults. And when you do histology, it reveals loss of pigmented neurons and round use and affiliate conclusions of alpha synuclein. So clinical features, um, I spelled it out as trap or traps. Do um, you guys know um, what symptoms might be? So you have tremor, rigidity, akinesia, bradykinesia, and postural instability or a shuffling gait. So that's or traps. Um, so this is that dementia is a common feature of late disease. Uh, and then there's another disease where if the dementia is early, you can differentiate. Um, but real quick, I'm not going to do the whole dopaminergic um, chart, but you have your cortex, which um, gives input to your basal ganglia, which will give input to your cortex again. So this is like a control system that allows movement. Um, your basal ganglia is also has your striatum. So I'm just gonna, all right. So <laughs> for some reason, it just kind of like froze on my screen. Sorry, can't write. <laughs> all right, so let me start again. Um, so real quick, I wanted to talk about the whole movement system. Um, I know we've gone into it in detail in the previous lecture, but you have your cortex, your basal ganglia, and that sends feedback back to your cortex. Um, and then you have your striatum, that's your basal ganglia, 
and that receives input from your Substantia Niagara Pars Compacta. Okay, so um, your basal ganglia can either send a stimulatory um, effect to the cortex or an inhibitory um, uh, signal to the cortex, and this will all helping in the aid of movement. So you have your stimulatory and inhibitory. Um, and what your substantia Niagara Pars Compacta does is it releases dopamine to aid in the stimulatory or inhibitory pathways. So if you have D1, if it affects the D1 receptors, it's basically increasing the stimulatory effects to the cortex, so it's going to aid in movement. Um, and if you have D2, if it affects the D2 receptors, that basically inhibits the inhibitory receptors. So that again helps in the movement. So what dopamine does, it aids in the help, aids in the movement process from the, to the cortex. So this is a simpler version of how you can remember. There is another lecture that we went into detail about the whole movement process. Um, and if the dementia is an early onset, what does that suggest? What disease? Um. Lewy body dementia. That's the. That's another disease that we'll talk about. So your D1 receptor is a G protein subclass S, and it not only relaxes your uh, renal vascular smooth muscle, but it activates the direct pathway of the striatum. And D2 is the inhibitory or um, pathway or GI protein, and it modulates transmitter release, especially in the brain, and inhibits indirect pathway of this right so um, you can remember it like that if that helps you so Parkinson's disease as we talked about the uh, traps as the mnemonic for tremor rigidity akinesia bradykinesia postural instability and shuffling gait um, NT NPTP was a uh, kind of an unknown etiology, but historically there are rare cases related to exposure of MPTP, and it was a contaminant in some illicit drugs, um, and it metabolized to MPP positive, which is toxic to the substantia Niagara. So in Parkinson's, you have a loss of the dopaminergic neurons, and i.e. depigmentation of the substantia pars compacta, and here you can see Lewy bodies that are composed of alpha synucleins. So these are intracellular eosinophilic inclusions. And then Lewy body dementia, um, as we talked about, there's an earlier onset of dementia, um, but they also have Parkinsonian-like features. So there's kind of been an addition in 2018 first stage compared to 2017, but these patients, you'll see visual hallucinations, uh, dementia with fluctuating cognitive uh, cognition or alertness, uh, REM sleep, behavior disorder, and Parkinsonianism. Um, and it's called Lewy body if the cognitive and motor symptom onset are less than one year apart. Otherwise, it's considered secondary uh, dementia, secondary to Parkinson's disease. So a little bit different this year, but um, if the onset of cognitive and motor symptoms are really close, then you can say it's Lewy body dementia. Otherwise, it's just a secondary dementia to Parkinson's. And again, you see intracellular Lewy bodies that's in the previous slide. All right, Huntington's disease is a degeneration of the GABAergic neurons and the caudate nucleus of the basal ganglia. Um, so what is a trinucleotide repeat? Mode of inheritance and which chromosome does it affect? CAG, autosomal. Recessive chromosome. Sure the oh, autosomal dominant and chromosome 13? No. no. Chromosome 4. So it's autosomal dominant, chromosome 4, and CAG repeat in the Huntington gene. Um, and then there's a further expansion of repeat during spermatogenesis leads to anticipation. Um, 
It's a stupid question now that I think about it. Um, but um, so the presentation of these patients will have uh, chorea, which uh, progresses to dementia and depression, and acetosis, which are slake like movements of the fingers. And average age of presentation is about 40 years. Um, and then most common cause of death in these patients, does anybody know? It's suicide, mm -hmm. it's the most common cause of death. So looking at this picture, um, figure B is a normal caudate nucleus, while figure A is the one with the Huntington's disease. So let me just label a few things on this diagram. Here's your gray matter. Here's your white matter. Um, and then there are your ventricle spaces. So I think these are your lateral ventricles. Um, and then you have your, sorry, caudate nucleus right here, your putamen right here. Um, and then you have the space in between, which is your internal capsule. So adding this whole thing together, your caudate and putamen is your striatum, essentially. And your caudate, I'll do it on this side, releases your GABA neurons. Um, so typically, you can recognize the caudate by the ones that are pushing into the ventricles. So if you get an image of the ventricles and you don't know where the caudate is, you can see the one that's pushing in to the ventricles. Um, and here in a Huntington's patients, you basically lost the caudate nucleus. So here's your putamen. You still got your internal capsule, but there's no caudate nucleus. And that's why these ventricles are so enlarged because there's no nothing pushing them in. Um, and then that can lead to hydrocephalus ex vacuo. So that's an enlarged ventricle due to the loss of brain mass, not because of extra CSF, just because you lost brain mass. And that's why they've enlarged. So that can lead to a hydrocephalus ex vacuo. So any questions about this? Does anybody want to add or take away anything? Okay. So here, this is from first aid, just to go over it real quick. You have, it's an autosomal dominant trinucleotide CAGS as he mentioned. It's a repeat expansion of the Huntington gene on chromosome four. So the symptoms will manifest between the ages of 20 to 50. Uh, you get apoptosis, aggression, depression, dementia, and you can mistake this for substance abuse. So the anticipation results from the expansion of CAG. Um, and then there's an atrophy to the caudate and putamen with ex vacuo ventriculomegaly. You have an increase in dopamine, decrease in GABA, um, and you have neural death via NMDAR binding in glutamate exotoxicity. So essentially, if you want a simpler, you have your cortex, again, to your basal ganglia, to your cortex. So this is how you're basically controlling your movement. Here, you have your GABA neurons, which will affect um, the movement. So they're inhibitory um, neurons, which basically stop unwanted movement. So if you got rid of the GABA, you're going to have involuntary movements. Um, so you're not going to, you're just going to have random firing. So you'll get random movements because you lost the GABA that was blocking the back. So, um, so this is from Kaplan. Uh, you can, in Parkinson's, it's a direct pathway lesion, um, and that leads to loss of pigmented dopaminergic neurons from the substantia nigra, as we've talked about. There's the clinical manifestations. In Huntington's disease, it's due to a lesion of the indirect pathway, 
um, and that's because you lost the GABAnergic neurons in the uh, striatum. It's autosomal dominant, so just another way you can think about it. And the last one that I want to talk about is spongiform encephalopathy. Uh, this is a degenerative disease due to prion protein. So your prion protein is normally expressed in a PRP B, um, and this is like the alpha form. Now, the prion protein can go to PRP SC, which is the beta form, and this is what accumulates in the neurons. And what the bad thing about PRP SC is that it can go back to PRP C um, and make more of PRP SC. So make more of the bad uh, prion proteins. Um, and that can lead to more problems. So that's when the disease arises is when you have your PRP uh, or your beta, uh, beta pleated confirmation of the PRP SC is made. So conversions can be either sporadic, they can be inherited, so they're familial forms of the disease, or you get exposed to the prion proteins. So those are the three ways that you can get it. Um, in creutzfeldt jakob disease, it's the most common spongy form encephalopathy, and it's usually sporadic, um, and it rarely arises due to exposure of prion-infected human tissue, such as human growth hormone, or when you do a corneal transplant, um, you can get affected, but it's to these beta-pleated proteins, but it's rare. Um, and these patients present with rapid progressive dementia and often associated with ataxia. And they get a startle myoclonus, which are involuntary contractions of the muscle with minimum voluntary input. So you get myoclonus, rapid progressive dementia, and ataxia. So those are common symptoms. Um, and they re usually result in death in less than one year, one, less than one year. And you have the variant form, which are related, related to exposure of the bovine spongy form mental cephalopathy, which is a mad cow disease. And those you'll commonly see younger patients being affected and who've eaten bad cow. Um, and for these ones, you'll also see a spike in the EEG and you'll see this increase in 1433 protein in the CSF. So that is all I got for you guys. Do you guys have any questions? So I have a few questions for you. You have a 69-year-old man who was brought to the physician by his wife because of three-month history of progressive worsening dysarthria, gait instability, intentional tremor, and memory loss. He has no notable medical or family history. EEG shows a, a triphasic spike, um, and CSF is obtained, which shows an elevated 1433 protein. He continues to deteriorate and dies four months later. CT of the head is um, unremarkable, but an MRI is notable for cortical ribboning. Signs of which of the following would the researcher expect to find in abnormal brain tissue? B for boy. So yeah, the answer is B, and the giveaway was your uh, triphasic spike. You got your elevated 1433 protein, um, but they also have tensional tremor and memory loss, and they died at a very young age, or, well, within six months of age. So, so that's another giveaway. Does anybody have any questions about the other answer choices? Or are we good? Mm -hmm. Good. All right, so you have a 74-year-old man who comes to the physician because of a four-year history of postural instability, frequent falls, and cognitive decline. He has bradykinesia of the upper limb and resistance upon passive flexion of his elbows. He walks with a slow shuffling gait. When asked to write out his name, it is found that his handwriting is very small. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? B for boy. Okay. Divya? I said it at the same time. <laughs> I don't think you heard me. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So yeah, the answer is B. 
if anybody has any questions about this one. No. So I guess if you're looking for clues in the mm -hmm. question, you have your instability, frequent falls, cognitive decline, um, bradykinesia, um, shuffling gait, I guess can be one. And then handwriting is small, apparently is also another yeah, good thing to, I guess, relate back to Parkinson's. Okay, that's it for me. Simple.